All right. Book of Acts, chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4 again tonight. Last week we saw the background of what was going on here in Acts chapter number 4 as Peter and John had healed a lame man and they were preaching. And uh, of course the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, uh, they didn't like what was going on and so they, uh, they were grieved that they taught the people and they... Uh, we're preaching about the resurrection of the dead. You know, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead, but uh, Jesus did arise. And so they laid hands on them, put them in hold, and uh, then uh, they, when they brought them before the rulers and the elders and the scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and uh, there was a bunch of folks that were trying to uh, intimidate them. And... Peter took the opportunity to preach again. And he preached. Uh, and uh, uh, whenever we see down in verse number, we're down in verse number 13. It says here in Acts 4.13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And we're looking at that last phrase there. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And we're asking the question, what do others know of us? You know, what do they take knowledge of in our life? And uh, the Scripture shows that if God's salvation is at work in us, then it ought to be working itself in the outside of our life. And... Uh, oh, so that others can see it. And that's, of course, found in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 12 and 13 where uh, Paul told them to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. He said, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. We don't, we don't work for our salvation, but it, we are to work it out. It's in there. Work it out so others can see it. And we said that Peter and John uh, were living true Christian lives. They weren't, they weren't scared of what was going on. That was the intention, was to intimidate them into silence. And they weren't going to be intimidated. Uh, and when they remained bold, they took notice of them and perceived that they had been with Jesus. And we see here how uh, those that took notice of them didn't like Peter and John <laughs> because they were like Jesus and they were preaching Jesus. Amen? Amen. With people that don't like Jesus, don't like the preaching of Jesus. And they, they thought that once they had done away with Jesus by crucifying Him, that, that all this Jesus craze would be over. It just multiplied. <laughs> it just multiplied all the, the disciples and, and those that uh, got saved. This movement kept growing, uh, the movement of Christianity. People were getting saved. Lives were being changed. In fact, uh, uh, you'll, you'll read there that the number that got saved from Peter's preaching there after Peter and John healed the lame man, there are about 5,000 people from that preaching right there. So, you know, they're not liking what's going on. The, these, these folks that have brought them before them, and uh, they didn't like people getting saved, they didn't that, that, like the lives being changed. And the point is that these folks knew Peter and John had been with Jesus. It was evident uh, that Jesus had impacted their lives in a tremendous way. And we also saw uh, how the, the same was true of both the Roman believers and the Thessalonian believers. Both of those churches had really good testimonies. You read the, especially the beginning of the books, uh, uh, Romans and First and Second Thessalonians, it t t talks about their, their testimony. They had great testimonies. Their testimonies were being talked about all around the known world. You know, all around Asia and in that area. And last week we only had time to share uh, the first point of this message as we began to look at how the world should be able to know that we are believers in Christ or that we belong to Christ. And we said the first thing, and I'm not going to preach it again, but I do want to review it for the fact of the, those that, that weren't here uh, last week, but they should know that we are Christians by our attitude toward sin by our attitude towards sin. We said repentance is important. Repentance is important in getting saved. Peter and John had, had turned from their sin of unbelief and to belief in Christ, and they were, they were all in in their belief in Christ. They were all in to, to, to Jesus. 
and understand that uh, you know, they that belief was evident in their lives. We said that uh, uh, repentance is important not only in getting saved, but repentance is important in, and uh, uh, after we're saved also, that repentance from unbelief to belief that led not only to their salvation, but after that point, it led them to repent of the sins that were revealed to them by the Lord afterwards. And that's, that's the way it is with our life. That's how we grow in the Lord. The Lord shows us things that we need to put off in our life, the things we need to put on. And again, I'm not going to preach all that again, but we, we dealt with that last week. And... Uh, understand that these men were just sinners saved by grace just as we are. They weren't super Christians. They were just sinners saved by grace and they had to grow just the same way you and I had to grow. And uh, But repentance was important. It was important in getting saved and it was important after they got saved. And we said that compromise is unacceptable for the Christian. Compromise is when a believer tries to blend the characteristics of what is acceptable with this world with the characteristics of what is acceptable with God. Those two areas don't mix. They don't mix. Uh, we are to be distinctively different. We are to be distinctively Christian. Uh, the school that I went to and got my Bible training, uh, Tennessee Temple University in Chattanooga, that was their motto, distinctively Christian. You know why they're not in business now? Because they lost their distinctive uh, Christianity there. And they were no longer distinctively Christian, be begin to blend with the world and give up their, their standards that they had. When a believer tries to hold on to the world tightly and profess Christ at the same time, it confuses both the world and the church. And the result is a hybrid that doesn't fit with either the world or with the cause of Christ. And if we truly love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and we would love our neighbor as ourselves, and we know that compromise will be as unacceptable with us as it is with God. And then we said people ought to be uh, able to see a difference in our lives. Um, that there needs to be a notable change in our walk and talk if we are professing Christians. As, you know, you don't go about your, your life as you did before. No, there's a difference. You've been changed. And both other believers and the world should be able to see that we have left our sin and that we are walking with the Savior now. Uh, and we use the example of Saul uh, walking the Damascus Road as a persecutor. He was headed to Damascus to arrest Christians and to persecute them and to kill them. And the Lord got a hold of him. He got marvelously saved. And people had a hard time believing until they just took time to look at his life. He changed his name to Paul. The Apostle Paul is what we know him by. And uh, he, he immediately preached uh, Jesus. And uh, he, 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 there was a distinctive change in his life. So the first point was they should know we are Christians by our attitude towards sin. Now tonight, let's pick up there and we see number two thing. They should know we are Christians by the things that satisfy us. What are the things that satisfy you now that you are saved? What is it that satisfies you? Look at Luke chapter number 12. And you can let Acts go. I, we just wanted to use that uh, where to, so you know where we're taking uh, uh, these two messages from and why we're taking a look at this. Uh, Luke chapter number 12 and we want to look at verse number 16. Luke 12, 16, a parable told by our Lord. Luke 12, verse 16 says, And he spake a parable unto them, uh, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought with him himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? 
so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What satisfies you? Uh, in this parable, we find a man that had pretty much ru ruled God out of his life because he couldn't hang on to God and hang on to the pleasures of the world. He was seeking satisfaction in his farms and his barns and his grain. Uh, we're talking about satisfaction with material things, material things. But let me ask you this. What kind of message are believers sending to the lost world if their focus is the same as the world? So that's the focus of the world. If, you know, just get all you can. I mean, they, they, they want, they're trying to get as much as they possibly can. They want to move forward in the world. There's nothing wrong with being uh, wanting better for yourself. But uh, we, I'm talking about you, you, you focus on things to, to the exclusion of God whatsoever in it. We need to look and see if our focus is on material things because it shouldn't be. Colossians chapter number 3 tells us where our focus is to be in verses 1 through 4. says, If ye then be risen with Christ, though, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's where our focus is to be. He says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him, in glory. That's Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4. Now, if we have become wrap, wrapped up with uh, uh, seeking material things like the world, then this lost world will not be able to tell that we've been with Jesus. You know, that's that way. those people are no different than I am. They're, they're, they're going after the same things I'm going after. And we need to think about what we're teaching our children and grandchildren by the way that we live and by what we live for. What values are we instilling in them? You know, we want, you want them to be in church? Well, you be in church yourself. I mean, you can't teach one thing and then show a different thing. You got you got to show. You got to be consistent in what you're, you're what you're sharing with uh, your children and grandchildren. Listen, we should we should seek our satisfaction from God. David said in Psalm 42, verse 2, he said, My soul thirsteth for God. My soul thirsteth for God. What, what do you hunger and thirst for? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 6, He says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you have a hunger to be more righteous, the Lord said, if you get really hunger and thirst after that, you'll be filled with that. Uh, I'm afraid many times we're not, we're not hungry and thirsty for the right things. Jesus said in John 7, 37, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And well, we came to Christ for salvation. But listen, we must also come to the Lord for our satisfaction. Others will know that we are Christians when we seek satisfaction in the Lord alone. In the Lord alone. That's who we seek satisfaction in. So they should know we're Christians by our attitude towards sin. They should know uh, we're Christians by the things that satisfy us. Number three, they should know we're Christians by our attitude toward others. Flip back a couple of pages there to Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10, Jesus tells a, 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 a parable here also. We know it as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the, the, there are three basic philosophies of life and they are displayed in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we're going to go ahead and read this, Luke 10. Uh, let's take a look at verse number 30. Luke 10, verse 30. And of course, Jesus is telling this story. Uh, it was a guy that was willing to, he was wanting to justify himself, uh, according to verse 29. He said, uh, and who is my neighbor? And so Jesus is telling this story in the answer of who is my neighbor? And, and Jesus answering said, verse 30, A certain man went down to, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So we see three philosophies. Let me share with you real quickly these three philosophies that we find here. First, philosophy number one is what is thine is mine. What is thine is mine. That's the philosophy by the thieves. You know, uh, they saw this man as someone who had something that they didn't have, so he was fair game. They took everything that he had and left him half dead. And that's the philosophy of this world. Get what you want, no matter who it may hurt. It's an attitude of total selfishness. We're not to be selfish, are we? We're not to be. It's an attitude that says, get all you can, ever, however you can, then can all you get, and then sit on the can, you know. And, and so, you know, that that is that is not what we want to do. What what is thine is mine. So, some would never dream of robbing a person like these men did. Well, they might cheat the IRS. They might steal from the company they work for, or they might cheat an insurance company, or they might rob God of His tithe. You hear what I'm saying? That is the what is thine is mine philosophy. Philosophy number two here is what is mine is mine. Okay, and that's the attitude portrayed by the priest and the Levite. Two religious folks. Amen. Um, and they had no time for others. They were too busy with their own agendas. They both saw the need. I mean, they could tell this fellow was hurting. But they walked away. Uh... So many today are blind to the needs of others because of selfishness, greed, and apathy. Apathy, most of the time, many just plain don't care. That's what apathy is, don't care. And so they say, what, what's mine is mine, and I'll keep what's mine. And it was going to take some time. They weren't willing to give of their time to help this man. It was going to take some money. Uh, and it was going to take Probably getting a little dirty because the fellow really needed help in a bad way. And so uh, that what is mine is mine philosophy, that's not a good Christian philosophy either. Now philosophy number three is what is mine is thine. And that's the attitude presented by the Good Samaritan. That is the attitude of Jesus Christ. Listen to 2 Corinthians 8 verse number 9. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. Amen. What a blessing. Amen. Jesus didn't have to leave heaven. He didn't have to leave the throne in heaven, but He did. He became a man. <laughs> he came down here and He he not only became a man, but he, he, he sacrificed himself. He gave all so that we might have uh, life and have it more abundantly. That, that was the attitude of God when He gave His only begotten Son for you and me. When we see a need, what do we do? Which of these attitudes do we display by our action? There's a song written by Charles Meggs, I guess is how you not say the guy's name, Charles D. Meggs. Remember it growing up. Uh, it's in the old, old songbooks. And it's called Others. Any of you ever heard the, the song Others? Uh, here, here are the words. It's, Lord, help me live. Help me to live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer will be for others. 
Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I do for you must needs be done for others. Let me be crucified and slain and buried deep and all in vain. My efforts be to rise again unless to live again for others. And when my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven's begun, may I forget the crown I've worn while thinking still of others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like Thee. That's the song I wanted to sing, but I couldn't find, couldn't find the music to it. I just found the words, but I remember it from uh, as, a, as a child growing up. So they should know we are Christians by our attitude towards sin. They should know we are Christians by the things that satisfy us and by our attitude toward others. And then last of all, they should know we are Christians by our fruits. By our fruits. And I want you to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 7 for this. Matthew 7. And, of course, uh, Jesus is speaking here. He's told His disciples, uh, He's teaching them to beware of false prophets. He, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. And I... Uh, I know that uh, we're not dealing with false prophets, but the, the principle is still the same. Matthew 7, look at verse number 15. Uh, look what it says. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. There's a principle there. Okay. Do men gather the grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, I know that this is primarily talking about, uh, in this context, it's talking about false prophets, but uh, that also works with us. What kind of fruit are we bearing in our lives? The title Christian, in its original sense, meant to be Christ-like. You know, it's become a really a, a term that is used very loosely. So if you've got any kind of loose association with Christ, they'll put the tag Christian on it. And that's even the cults. I mean, in our day and time, Mormons are called Christians. They're not Christians. Their Christ is not the Christ of the Bible. He's not. He's just not. When you find out what they believe about Christ, he doesn't match up with what's in the Scripture here. And so, uh, what, what I'm saying here is that uh, the title Christian, uh, we need to go back and, and think about the original sense. Uh, the, the Christians in Antioch were the first ones that the term was applied to, but it, but it meant to, to be Christ-like. And if we're filled with the Spirit of God, and think about this, if we're filled with the Spirit of God, and if we're saved, we are. Okay? If you're saved, you've got the Spirit of God living within. And if you're filled with the Spirit, not just indwelt by the Spirit, but if you're filled with the Spirit of God, then the fruit of the Spirit ought to be evident in your life. Yay or nay? Right. Yay. Right. <laughs> Amen. It ought to be. If you're filled with the Spirit, the fruit's going to come forth. Paul mentioned... Uh, he, he makes a comparison of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. I'm not going to take time to turn to Galatians 5, 19 through 23, but you ought to turn over there and read Galatians 5, 19 through 23. It begins with the works of the flesh. Those things are manifesting in your life. you got real problems. Uh, and then it has the fruit of the Spirit. It, it, it's not our fruit. It's the Holy Spirit producing His fruit through our lives because we are filled with with Him. We are chosen to bear the image of Christ to a lost and dying world. The question is, what kind of fruit is being produced in our lives? That's why it's so important for us to be filled with the Spirit. In fact, uh, Paul says, if you fill with the Spirit, you won't, you won't, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, that's, that's the, you say, well, how, how do I stop sinning? Be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> if you fill with the Spirit, the, the, you'll not, not uh, fulfill the lust of the flesh. Some, some would say that it doesn't matter what others think of us. 
And in some ways that might be true, but it does matter that we represent Christ faithfully here in this life. And I mean, they ought to know that we're associated with Christ. They may not like that, but they ought to know by our lives that we're different than they are. Amen. 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 Consider tonight these things that we've looked at. What is your attitude towards sin? What is your attitude towards sin? Where do you seek your satisfaction? What is your attitude toward others? And what kind of fruit are you bearing? Do others know that you're a Christian by what they see in you? And our desire should be that someone might take notice that we have been with Jesus. Amen? And, and I trust that uh, you will take these things that we take a look at and allow the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in your life tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your love for us. We thank You for Your Holy Spirit that dwells within now that we are saved. And Lord, the Holy Spirit took up residence in our lives. But Lord, it's only as He fills our lives that uh, His fruit is manifested through our lives. And sadly, many Christians are not filled with the Spirit. They have the Spirit living within, but uh, they are they are living their lives uh, according to the flesh rather than according to the Spirit. They're not walking in the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Lord, help us to walk in the Spirit. And if we're walking in the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is being manifested in our lives, people are going to be able to tell the difference in our lives. They're going to be able to tell that we belong to Jesus. Lord, that ought to be the goal. It ought, ought to be for folks to think how good a person that we are or look at what they're doing. And it ought to be about magnifying our Savior, magnifying the One who has given us salvation, lifting up uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in all that we say, all that we do, and all of how we live. Lord, we're not adequate for these things. We're, we're still just sinners saved by grace, but Lord, uh, with your help, they can be a reality in our lives. Lord, if there's one here tonight that doesn't know you as Savior, there's no possibility. They don't have the Spirit living inside. There's no possibility of them, of them uh, walking the way that we're talking about tonight. Help them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus so they have the Spirit within and so that the Spirit, uh, they can then walk in the Spirit not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Just bless our invitation now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.